Tonight, I'm very excited to welcome Caitlin Zaloom to Politics and Prose. Zaloom is an author who wears many hats as a trained anthropologist, receiving her PhD in the field from Berkeley. Uh, she's co-founder of the remarkable digital magazine Public Books, which features some of the best cultural criticism you'll find anywhere online. Uh, she has been the recipient of numerous fellowships and honors, including a fellowship in 2016 and 2017 at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences based at Stanford University. And she currently serves at New York University as an associate professor of social and cultural analysis. In her new book, Indebted, she brings all of those gifts to bear uh, in a powerful analysis of what's sometimes been called the college industrial complex. As exemplified in the subtitle, how families make college work at any cost. It's as much an investigation of the psychological pressures associated with sending children to university as it is a breakdown of debt structure itself, uh, which makes for supremely empathetic and passionate writing around a topic that holds immense weight for an increasing amount of United States citizens today, especially with college semesters just starting nationwide. Uh, to guide the conversation today, we're thrilled to have Zaloom in conversation with longtime progressive activist and scholar Dorian Warren, who's currently the president of the sister organizations Community Change and Community Change Action, uh, leading the fight to build social movements from the ground up. So please join me in welcoming both Saloom and Warren to Politics and Prose. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, because we're at Politics and Prose, and I love this bookstore, and I love this series, so if you want to protest student debt, let's just get it out the way now and not interrupt Caitlin during the talk. That was a joke for those of you who knew about a previous book series, uh, book event, where some white nationalists came in and protested the author um, very famously, because it's politics and prose. So it's really great to be here and in conversation with you. And Jonathan did the introduction that I was going to do. So um, I actually want to skip to your first book, because you are okay. trained, you call yourself an economic anthropologist, and you're trained as a cultural and economic anthropologist. And I was always really struck by your very first book, Out of the Pits, which is an ethnography of essentially financial markets, where Kate spent some time on the trading floors and futures markets, if I recall, in Chicago and London. And I want you to talk about the origin story of this book, but walk us through how did you get from out of the pits to indebted? Um, well, so first let me say thank you to Politics and Prose and to Jonathan and especially to Dorian, Dorian for being in conversation with me today. It's great to be here. Uh, and I do have a sort of unusual trajectory because my first book, like Dorian was saying, uh, is about – financial futures markets and uh, and traders in those markets. Uh, and as an anthropologist, the way that I did research for that project was to, uh, to go and uh, first a clerk at what was on the Chicago Board of Trade, and then uh, to actually trade myself in futures at a dealing room in, in London. So, um, so I think it's a very good question as to how I went from that to writing about student debt. And the, the switching point was actually when I got my first job um, as an academic. And I was presented with, uh, with these kind of forms that both simultaneously made me feel very lucky uh, because they were offering me uh, 401k options, retirement options, um, that were also very financialized. And then also, at the same time, they made me feel very confused. So despite the fact that I had worked as a futures trader, I had literally no idea what to do um, with these choices that were put in front of me. You know, what, what was the right vehicle to pick? I don't know, maybe the one in the middle? I mean, so, the, uh, so I, I started to ask myself questions about kind of like, okay, what does it mean to to operate within this financial economy, not as a professional, but rather as just like a regular person trying to live your life. Um, and uh, and so, so these retirement um, things seemed very important. But as I got farther into my teaching career, I started to hear from my students all about student debt and what, the, what taking on debt in order to achieve the education that was supposed to free them 
in fact meant to them. And what that meant, meant more often than not was anxiety, pressure, and a sense that they were going to go forward in their lives carrying a debt that was going to, in fact, hamper um, the very freedoms that they were trying to get by achieving edu- education. So, um, so it turned out that it was the most important thing that I could study was absolutely the thing that was right in front of me already. And we'll, we'll come back to methodology and your approach in a minute, but I think there's a person in the book, Kimberly, who's a student who helps open this door for you. Yes. And you end up talking to her mother, June, mm-hmm. too. So talk to us about their story and how it branched into this larger book project. Yes. Kimberly, she, this uh, student, Kimberly, was was really uh, who, the, the, the student who literally opened the door on the project for me. Uh, I mean, it was because she had taken like four classes with me. I knew her extremely well. And one day she knocked on my door and I opened it and she was standing there crying. And, and of course, I didn't expect that at all. And, and I felt like I really needed to understand what was making her so very upset because it, it wasn't only the debt and and uh, and because we knew each other well already um, she started telling me very quickly about the story of her family um, uh, which which began with her mother uh, when she when Kimberly was was little who uh, who, who was working as a, a waitress um, and was a single mom had three kids and was kind of dreaming forward especially for Kimberly um, who showed all the signs of being being a remarkable student. Um, so, so June very early on started to kind of live this, uh, her, live her aspirations um, through Kimberly and, and cultivated them in Kimberly's, Kimberly's life too. You know, they, together they really dreamed of, of, of going off to New York and making a better life and, uh, and, and creating a situation where Kimberly could really realize her talents. That was the project of the family from very very early on, even though the family did not have much in terms of means. So, uh, so that kind of intergenerational aspiration and kind of desire, um, you know, that was what Kimberly helped me realize was at the heart of this project and the heart of, of why people pay so much for college in the first place. So there, there are a couple, there are lots of fascinating concepts in the book that help us understand this current predicament, particularly for middle-class families around debt, student debt. So I want to unpack two of the concepts, and then I want you to walk us through a bit of the process. So okay. the two concepts I want you to unpack, the first is um, the student finance complex, which made me think of the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex. So what the hell is that? <laughs> what is a student finance complex? And then I want you to talk about your definition of middle class, because it's really, really important. And sociologists and economists have lots of definitions, like who counts, who's in the middle class and who doesn't. And Caitlin has a particular definition and meaning of middle class that I think is unique and important for us to understand. So let's Mm -hmm. unpack those two concepts Mm -hmm. first, and then Mm -hmm. I'll come back and Mm -hmm. ask you to walk us through the process. Okay. Can I, can I, can I do them in reverse order? Okay, great. Uh, So I defined middle class in this book as being um, too wealthy or having too much income to qualify for major federal loans for higher education and being um, unable to pay for college by writing a check. Uh, So I did that because... um, I wanted to create a definition of what middle class life was that fit our financial economy. So I wanted to come up with a definition that specifically looked at uh, at debt and credit um, as as the as the major lever. And all of the families in my study have student loans and need student loans to get their kids to and through college. So uh, so. So from that perspective, families who fall into that band enter into this thing that I call the student finance complex very early on. And this and the student finance complex is the um, the, the set of institutions that uh, that come together in order for in order to enable 
uh, middle class families to to invest and to get into debt in order to get their kids to school. And usually we think of those things as being kind of separate. So like there's the financial industry off over here that that offers investment vehicles. And there's the federal government over here and they offer, you know, there are the major student loan programs. And then, uh, you know, and then there's colleges and universities over here and they're the ones that give aid. But, uh, but thinking about them separately, um, is more of a kind of policy perspective. And what I wanted to do is to really honor the vision of what, uh, of what families saw when they looked at this problem. And what, what they see is how do I, you know, is, is what the answer should be when they ask the question, how do I solve this problem of getting my kid to school? And that means starting with things like the possibility of investment when when kids are young, which almost no one does because they can't afford it anyway. Um, but uh, but they're getting a message: you should save even if you can't. So the um, so that that starts very early. Then they have to go through the federal government. Then they go through colleges and and universities to get aid. And together, that thing is the is what I call the student finance complex. So let's pick up there because the book is structured in a really interesting way in terms of the chapters, and it's sort of the the process um, through time from birth until a kid is in college and is and is comes out with debt. Yeah. So you start with the 529s, and then I think it's to do a little alphabet soup, the FAFSA, which I vaguely remember. Um, you can I explain still what that's struggle for. with having to pronounce uh, it, even though I've typed it literally thousands of times. FAFSA, that form you have to fill out with the parents when you're trying to get a loan or grants. And then it goes to the expected family contribution, and then plus loans, and then direct loans. So walk us quickly through, what is this process of, yeah. of acquiring debt yeah. for the future investment? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it starts out with um, being unable to pay in the first place. So that, that I think, is the first fundamental realization that, that families um, get to, that they're going to have to take out loans in order to do this. And, and so it actually starts from a sense, often, of, uh, of a kind of failure um, that that families understand that they have not, in fact, saved enough, that their incomes are not going to meet this on their own, and that they better figure out a way to get into debt in or, or to kind of like bootstrap it you know, in all of the many ways that people try to do, um, if their kid is going to have the opportunity that, of course, they they definitely want that kid uh, to have. And so, right, they move from 529s, they fill out this really confusing FAFSA thing, which oftentimes does, does not fit their definition of family. It does not account for the responsibilities they believe that they, you know, they, they, they carry and, and hold dear. Um, and then they get this number, the expected family contribution, that they oftentimes feel like is out of whack with how much they really can pay. So, uh, so by the time they suddenly have to get into debt, it is under conditions in which um, they already feel at a, like a, a sense of, of failure, and then that that they've been told kind of again and again by the institutions um, that are supposed to support them that they don't really fit, and uh, and so that that sense is already really undermining even before they get to to actually you know like having to pay anything back at all. So I'm struck, but you used the word failure, sense of failure. You've used the word shame. So now I'm going to get to your methodology. So yeah. Caitlin interviews 160 people, parents and students. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very interesting methodology because it's not like most social scientists who just might do a survey and ask some questions. It really gets to the heart of how people make sense and make meaning of this process. So what did you find that was most unexpected Mm -hmm. from these interviews? What were Mm -hmm. your assumptions going into this project and Mm -hmm. what did you, what surprised you? Mm -hmm. Well, one, one of the things that surprised me most, and this has to do with methodology itself, was just how hard it was to get the interviews in the first place. Um, I mean, it was incredibly hard. So it's one thing to kind of send out a survey to ask people um, uh, to, to tell you things about, uh, uh, about issues they feel anxiety about or concerned about or feel like failures about. Uh, and 
also, of course, as, as, as you all know, Dorian, and many of you will know, when you ask people those questions in surveys, they will just answer them incorrectly in order to avoid the shame. So, uh, so, so surveys under these conditions are already suspect, and I, I knew that. Um, uh, but it was also very, very hard to get people to talk to me about their uh, uh, about their household um, finances, about kind of how they paid, what debt they had, uh, and, and especially because all of those issues connected to what they were able to do as parents. So it really, it was really about that, uh, the, the heart of family life. And so it took a, v- a very, very, very long time to find, uh, the families who would, who would talk to me, uh, about these issues. And, uh, and, you know, it, it also connects to, to your work in a way, because one, one of the ways that I uh, ended up unlocking it was, was that I, um, hired someone who'd been a community organizer, <laughs> uh, and really knew how to, how to talk to people uh, about 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 issues that that meant a lot to them, and that was very important. So let's stay on this for a minute because what's fascinating about the book is this really sense of privateness within families. I mean, a seventeen or eighteen year old oftentimes is discovering family income for the first time in these conversations because they're sort of secrets. Yeah. Right? So how did you unlock this? these financial secrets of families much less get underneath the shame and the moral conflicts they experience in this process. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, that was a, that's a very complicated question. So, I mean, of course we, we all know that, that, that middle-class people, um, do not like to talk about to outsiders about money. Period. Um, in fact, I would, I would even go so far as to say that that is one of the defining features of Middle class life that there is a sense of independence um, that 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 people shore up by remaining silent about their their uh, financial condition, um, one way or the other, whether it's it because they're struggling or because they're doing very well. It's just right. uh, you know I don't need to talk to you about that because I'm an independent person. Um, so there's already that silence on the outside. Um, Parents, I also found, did not want to talk to their their children about it either. So there's a thing that I that I called nested silences inside the family. There's there's a silence on the outside, but then there's also a silence on the inside as well. Um, and so many 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 of the children who are becoming students um, and and like filling out the FAFSA form, um, don't in fact know what their family income is, how much wealth they have, what kind of debt they're, even what kind of debt they're taking on. Um, so, and oftentimes I heard parents would fill out the FAFSA form for the kids. So they would even go so far as to, uh, as to record the information, like income, into this federal form, um, even though that form is supposed to be filled out by the kid. Um, so there, there is a very intense focus on silence and on maintaining those generational separations uh, around knowledge about, about money. So let's go back to the 90s when we were in college, ha, ha, ha. Um, a lot has changed. That thank you for smiling, Tom. Um, <laughs> for those of us in the, that went to college a little while ago, so I this book resonated for me because um, my mother, as a black girl in Southside Chicago, only had two options in her generation. It was nursing school or teachers college. Mm-hmm. She went to teachers college. So when I was applying to college, she didn't know what to do, and I just thought I'm going to apply to the big state school and it'll be cheaper. And I also applied to University of Michigan, mm-hmm. but I couldn't. I told you earlier I couldn't. Go because it was I would be paying out of state tuition, so I went to University of Illinois, um, and I didn't have that much debt, but I had enough that it took me until forty to pay it off, right? So that was in the nineties, right? So what's changed? Right, the cost of education, higher education. What's changed culturally? Talk to us about the context for yeah. these parents whom you interview, roughly two thousand seven and two thousand twelve. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the the big changes, as you mentioned, is that the cost of college is just much higher now than it than it was um, 
than it was when we were going to school. And uh, and also, there's just there, there's just this incredible variability too, uh, so that that uh, each student within a school can have like wildly different aid packages. So actually, you never know. And and even when you're applying, you actually never know uh, what kind of aid you might receive. So you so it, I mean, it's a very strange thing. Like, I mean, if you went into a car lot and were like, okay, this, this, you know, this car in front of me, this Ford might cost somewhere between, well, nothing and fifty thousand um, dollars that would be a weird decision that you'd have to make right I, I, like how would you even think begin to think about that um, and but that's what we do with college today and that's 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 a that's a big change um, for for lots of reasons like the rise of merit scholarships yep. they're the, just the rise of overall costs um, and, and and a lot of different issues so it's become a much much more uncertain decision for people and also a, a, a more costly one as well. So I like the Ford metaphor. I'm going to ask you to explain another one of your metaphors, and that is of um, being towed in an airplane to put your oxygen mask on yourself first <laughs> yeah. before you do your kids. Why do parents yeah. not do that? Yeah. Um, well, one, one thing that I love about that piece of advice, which is which is just everywhere. If you read the personal finance literature, that metaphor that you are supposed to put your own um, oxygen mask on before your kids, it is just in every piece of advice, which is why, I, which is why I put it in the book. And it's in every piece of personal, personal finance advice because no one follows it. Uh, because of course people look after their kids. Parents look after their kids before they look after themselves. If they didn't do that, you wouldn't have to repeat that over so and say, over again. So say more. So is the advice, is the advice meant to suggest, um, parents should be saving in a 401k and a 529? Instead of what? Yes, they're supposed to be. They are supposed to be saving for their own retirement before they before they pay for their kid to to go to college or or, or to pay to support that kid in the many ways that that parents do. But uh, but. You know, I think it just isn't such a surprise that middle class parents and probably all parents put their kids first. That's what they do. Um, I'm jumping around a little bit, but there's another concept you use that I want you to take a little bit of time to explain. So there's a distinction between what feminists have called social reproduction in terms of the labor and families and households and what you call social speculation. Mm -hmm. And I am a Vegas fan. I love to gamble. So I was like, <laughs> what is this all about? So what is social speculation and how, how does, how does it help you and us make sense of the student loan crisis on families? Yes. So the, so the concept of social reproduction, which I find to be incredibly useful and important is, uh, is that, that we think of capitalism as something that happens kind of in the in the business world or like between business and government, but outside the home. And feminist economists wanted to kind of switch that lens to say, actually, the home is at the heart of uh, of of how economies are produced and reproduced, and if that be, essentially because they are the places where workers are made. You know, uh, families make people um, who are workers, and then they take care of them when they get old and can't work anymore. That's what social reproduction is. And so it, that, that idea is about um, kind of the, the everyday steps that families take, and, 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 uh, and in doing so, um, contribute to our economy. Um, but I felt like there was another dynamic at work that I wanted to add, which was that today, Families have to put money down now, quite a lot of it, in hopes that something is going to work out in the future. And so it's not only the everyday steps that are important, it is also this kind of like long-term shot that we're asking families to take today, especially under these conditions 
of kind of increasing inequality that we live with. Families today have to put money down today in order to try to give their kids an opportunity to kind of jump into the tier of, uh, uh, you know, the, the very high tier where they're going to get stability, you know, freedom, control over their lives, um, rather than either uh, occupying an eroding middle, which many of those parents themselves occupy, or, you know, under, you know, what these parents would feel like are very dire conditions falling farther. So say more about the difference, just in terms of thinking of the future and what's changed, where before, um, I think you mentioned this in an interview with with Chris Hayes, you could expect... um, if you're a working class or lower middle class, if you got a job at Ford or GM, a good union job, that was kind of all you needed, right, in terms of thinking about the future. And today it seems like having a college degree is the bare necessity yeah. for having any hope of social or economic mobility, economic security. There's some deeper implications for communities of color you talk about. So what's changed, just to go back to that previous question, what's yeah. changed in the last several decades to set up this moral set of moral conflicts for families around student debt yeah. today? Yeah. So one thing I think is really important about the moment when there was a broader middle class and with, with union jobs, um, people uh, could kind of have a, an anticipation about how their life um, could could go right and that that and that sort of sense that there was a a path that they could follow their children could follow meant actually that they could focus on the decisions in right in their realm right so kind of they could focus on where their kid, uh, like what, what kind of talents their kid has, um, you know, what kind of career the kid might want to, to do and help them get, uh, to, to, to achieve that. Um, but today, uh, college is more important than ever in giving kids a shot. So, so people who are in a kind of lower middle class or, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to say like solidly middle class anymore. Cause like those professions like teacher and nurse don't, it's not so solid, but like, but people who are, were in, in those kinds of professions, they really want their kid to go to college because that is what is going to make that sort of stability possible. But going to college and tr- kind of searching for that stability means inflicting more instability in the present. And that is a really um, kind of painful irony that parents live with today. So your book is getting lots of attention. New Yorker Review, New York Times, Chris Hayes' podcast, some other things I probably don't know. What is it about the current political zeitgeist, in addition to sort of the obvious, we're in D.C., the obvious policy conversations, you know, whose who student debt relief policy is better, Elizabeth Warren's or Bernie Sanders, like there's that conversation. But why do you think your book is... Like, what do you think it's tapping into? Yeah. Um, and what are and what are the dominant narratives around student debt get wrong? Yeah. So I think that the first thing is that we tend to talk about student debt in terms of really big numbers, and I think you know I think that if you're that that if you're reading a lot about these issues, you you probably have them at the tip of your tongue because they they get written about so much. So 1.5 trillion dollars in outstanding student loans, 44 million borrowers. I mean the, these numbers we see them again and again and again, um, but they really don't convey the significance for family life. And I think that that is what I, what I hope indebted brings. And, uh, and, and I, and I do think that it's, uh, it's a way that people are, um, are experiencing what it means to, to live with the high cost of college and to live with student debt. It changes their relationships with their kids or with their parents and what they think about the, the is the future. It's not just, um, these kind of sums of sums of money, and I think that that's really uh, that's really important. Uh, another thing that I think um, we need to kind of we need to shift the focus on is that it it isn't just students. So we talk about it as the student debt crisis, but it is a much bigger intergenerational issue. It's not just about young people, although it certainly is about them. Um, it is also about their parents. It is oftentimes about their grandparents. Um, 
And this is actually one of the ways that, that the race question gets wrapped into it because um, in multi-generational white middle class families, there's, there's like a lot more wealth. Um, there's, you know, higher incomes over generations. They can, they can pay for young people to go to college. Um, it, that intergenerational sense of what college means um, and how people pay for it and, and what that that, that ultimately suggests for where the family can go, where the family can see its young people going, that's what really matters. It reminds me of what my, my grandmother, my mother used to always say to, to me and my brother about higher education and their way in which they made meaning of it and what it meant for them was they always said, get as much education as you can because no one could ever take it away from you. Right. So it was like the one part of like potential wealth, but it couldn't be stripped away. It was like something permanent. It was like you made it a higher, like you, you upped your class status mm-hmm. and, like you, and it was stability there because it couldn't be stripped. Mm-hmm. But they didn't quite understand that the, the value of it could also <laughs> decline, <laughs> right. right? If you're in right. debt at the same time. Right. Um, so I want to go to your final chapter and then I'm going to open it up to you. So get your questions ready because um, your final chapter, um, like most academic books, is the thinnest one. <laughs> it's the fewest <laughs> amount of pages about what is to be done. But it's t- I love the title. I think it's called A Right to the Future. And you do provide um, an alternative example for how we can organize higher education and the financing of it. Yeah. And you refer to the Australian system. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for some Americans, they're going to like be like, how dare you? But tell us a little bit about what is the Australian right. system and why is it a good um, North Star or an alternative out okay. there for how to organize? Yeah. Um, I mean, Australia, who can object to Australia? You know, I mean, it's not Sweden. <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, the, so I think that there, there, there are a few things and Australia is one, uh, is, is one poll we can look to, but another is actually even our own history. And I kind of want to, I want to start there, which is that, that, uh, public higher education in, in the United States used to be a lot more affordable. Um, and it was, and it was also much more obvious that public ed- higher education was available to whatever student could make the, could, could make the bar. Um, and that gave, young people of whatever class, um, a target to shoot for. Um, and, and since higher, since public higher education is so much more expensive now, that itself, I think, uh, really has, has, um, contorted the aspirational process. Um, you know, so like my stepfather went to CUNY when it was free. Um, and you're right. You know, wait, what? Like we had free college education in the United States. Yes, we did. We really, really did. It's, it's amazing how people don't believe that, but we had it (laughs) for a very long time. And it really like, I mean, the, the, the big transformation has only really been the last couple of, uh, the last couple of decades in the this right. place. I mean, um, and so I think that we need to remember that we had it. Um, you know, I, I mean, not only was there CUNY, um, I, you know, I'm a graduate of the University of California. Um, it existed there too. Um, and the University of California is one of the great engines of mobility for this country. Um, so step number one, back to what we had. Um, and actually, um, and actually, when I talk to people from places like Australia or pretty much any other country in the developed world, even those who have to pay now, like in the UK, they think we're crazy. Like really. And it was one of the things that I held on to when I was writing this book was that I should not and do not take for granted this system that we have. It isn't what we had in the past. And when I talk to people from outside the country, they also think, you know, this system we have is nuts. So I, I really did want to interrupt that sense of, uh, of inevitability or kind of complacency around it. Like, we shouldn't have this system. Um, and Australia, not only is education much cheaper, it isn't free, but it's much cheaper. Um, they also have a student debt system that doesn't punish people. I know that that's a really crazy idea that you could have a debt system that doesn't punish people. But even if we had the completely free college, as, as they do actually in Sweden, because, you know, I do like Sweden. But, um, uh, 
you know, students would still need money um, right. because we want them to study and not have to work all the time. So loans themselves are not not necessarily, um, uh, you know, the thing that we have to work against. Period. Um, they, but we do need terms as uh, as they have in Australia with um, with with kind of like high threshold for paying back and a uh, like fluctuating payment rate as you make more money or less. Um, th- those kinds of terms make debt um, doable for for young adults, and the, and it, and then then those same young adults don't have to look at the decade after they graduate from college, the most vulnerable decade of their adult life, and to n- understand that they will have to pay back loans. Um, that will be burdensome to them. That's the system that we have today, and that's the system that needs to go. So let me ask one more follow-up while I invite people to step up to either microphone there or there. Um, but when you say both the Australian system and going back, to, the going back part implies keeping a lid on the cost yeah. of higher education. So there's something to be done around the higher education institutions itself and the cost. And then you also are implying a change in the student finance complex Mm -hmm. around how we finance debt Mm -hmm. and how we think about debt. So it's like those two things. Both those things. Both those things together. Yeah. Great. So that leads right into my question. I am a creature from the past. Um, I was born in the 1940s. I went to college in the 1960s um, when it was, as you said, uh, I went to public school, K through 12. I went to something called the Seven Sisters. That's a long time ago when women weren't um, available. Uh, I mean, women's women's school, co-ed schools were not available in a lot of places. And I grew up in Massachusetts where the UMass was just starting. Mm-hmm. Um, and... My question is, how has college become so expensive? Is it the admin? I mean, there are fewer tenured professors. I mean, the graduate students who teach are paid nothing and get no benefits and no security. So it's not the labor. It can't just be the buildings. <laughs> uh, right. I, I just don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think anybody fully understands that. There are many, many answers to this question. So I'm just going to throw out a few, uh, a few ideas. Um, one is that in public education, state legislatures have been hacking away I know. at university budgets for literally decades. Uh, so the, and one of the reasons that tuition has gone up at right. state universities is that, uh, is that they, they have to get their money from somewhere in order to educate the students who come through their doors. And they get that money, um, if they're not getting it from the state legislature, from tuition. Um, another another part of the strategy is also that, that basically since the 80s, um, universities, and this is both public and, and private, um, have... Uh, have pursued something called a high tuition, high aid model so that they have a very high sticker price and then they funnel that money to aid for students with lower with lower incomes. But of course, that doesn't account for the chunk in the, middle. In the middle. Um, so there's a, so, so, so there's that. Okay. So, so that's one, that's one reason. Um, another issue, and I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up the issue about, about teaching and the, and the, and the shift from a mostly tenured or tenure track um, faculty to one that is actually now mostly based on adjunct labor. So, and I mean, graduate students too, and sometimes, um, but, uh, but, but so that's, that's created what we can think of as sort of a winner take all model within, within the academy. I mean, so there's, there's a small number of professors who, who do well um, and make good money and, but the most of the faculty get paid a pittance. The people who uh, who reliably make a lot of money are administrators, and there's been a massive increase in administrations um, across the college and university systems. So that is another. What big do cost. they do? 
Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah can you, <laughs> no, that, seriously. that was going to be my yeah. question too. Like, what do they do? I always <laughs> feel. What do they do? What, what, what do they do? <laughs> yeah. It's well. Well, it's very easy to expand administration positions, and it's very hard to narrow them. So it kind of it, it, it has a logic of, of of increase. But there there are a lot. There are even more reasons I could throw out. But those are two. Those are two big ones. We're going to go over here. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I have a question, but I want to get in on the nostalgia for the olden days. Mm -hmm. Really olden days, (laughs) not your olden days. Uh, My husband, too, went to CUNY without... For free, and I went to the University of California at Berkeley. Mm-hmm. It was not free. It was thirty-five dollars a semester. Oh no, that's how old I am. <laughs> but my question is: the recent scandal about the rich people who pay their their kids' way to admittance. Um, I know it's a totally different population than you're talking about. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any spillover of the interest in that to the interest in your book? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. what kind of connections are people making? Mm-hmm. I think that that's a very good question because, of course, those admission scandals are, uh, they're, they're, I mean, they're both totally baffling and utterly unsurprising. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's kind of shocking. Um, but the, they're, the one that fascinates me the most is actually the Illinois one or the one that has come out primarily in Illinois. I don't want to. I don't want to tag Illinois with the responsibility here, but but uh, we do have a governor in jail. Uh, there's so. all kinds of corruption in exactly. Illinois. I mean, it's just kind of like the milieu. But <laughs> but um, but anyway, for for the, for those of you who who, uh, who who might have just scanned the, the headlines, what what happened there is that as a, a parents in wealthy suburbs have been paying lawyers to effectively disown their kids legally, so that those kids would then be eligible for financial aid. Uh, targeted for kids who actually have no parents, um, and uh, and so they, they found this loophole within the within the system to to exploit legally. Uh, yeah, I see a lot of like head shaking or like yeah. I know. I feel like taken aback just describing it. I can't believe it's true. But that but yep yeah they disown their kids to get financial aid. Um, and but what's interesting to me about that is that the the system is so complex that that it actually opens these loopholes. It's a little like the tax Tax code. If you want to cheat while doing it, you can. So the 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 issue for most people is that um, is that when they when when if you're if you're not one of these parents, if you're a regular person, you have to take the terms of the student finance complex at their face value. You have to try to get the aid that you're uh, that that you're due as a citizen um, simply by you know, trying to make your way through it. So it's these, the, the fact that there are these, that there are these enormous loopholes, I think really, that really, um, you know, like gives a lie to the fact that this system is in- just so incredibly broken and that what we need is a very much a simplified system that will not uh, punish people for doing exactly the thing that we want them to do, which is to try to get their kid to college. Which is like Berkeley for all or CUNY for all or some. Yeah, like which some. we just call CUNY. Oh, right. Right? So like <laughs> Let's go here, and then we'll come back over here. So, um, Ken, I have a question not about the finances of higher ed, but about actually how students and their families choose between colleges. Yeah. So, I mean, in some ways, part of what's uh, interesting or baffling is why when students have a choice between Berkeley and NYU or Berkeley and Georgetown, Berkeley might be more expensive than it used to be, but it's still a lot cheaper than going to NYU and seemingly yeah. similar reputation and education and sort of networks that they get out of there. So um, I'm curious about sort of what, if that when that conversation happens between picking between a school that's very expensive and one that's sort of expensive but less expensive um, about reputations of schools or the things that sort of lead middle class families to go into a lot of debt to go to a more expensive school. Yes. I, so, so that's a, that, that is of course a great question and something I get into a lot and in, uh, in indebted, but first, the first, um, division though, that I, uh, that I want to, 
um, blur a little bit, in which I've probably been perpetuating my answers, is the, is the division between public and private schools. So from a family perspective, it is not always the case that there is the enormous difference between um, what a public school and a private school is going to cost. Uh, so given any individual kid's de decision, also from a family perspective, they might have one kid in public school and one kid in private school. And so from just the matter of finances, that that uh, that distinction is uh, is also blurred. I mean, one of the families that I uh, I profile in indebted has one kid at NYU and one kid at Buffalo State, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, so so already um, those decisions aren't necessarily so cut and dry. Um, and again, like what college is going to actually cost is oftentimes um, not clear from the beginning. And even if like, so for instance, in that family that I'm talking about, um, the the hope is that they will pay the first year and that then the, the child will do well enough, the student will do well enough to qualify for for merit aid or scholarships the next year. So, that be, so the, the kind of complexity of the system means that the decision is not always cut and dry in the first place. But the, um, but, but really parents want, always want uh, to, while on the one hand be financially responsible, also to get a really good fit for their kid. They, that, that's what the idea um, that really, that prevailed for most of the parents I spoke with, uh, where, where that resided. So um, parents and, and kids together would just would try to figure out like what are their talents, where do they want to go in their lives, and, and what environment was really going to be best for them. Um, and, and not to make the decision solely on the financial grounds uh, that, you know, would have the parents like strapping on their, their oxygen masks first before sending their kid off to a college that, that might be the right fit. Let's go here. Um, so having grown up in a culture where you're on the Ivy League bus or you go bust and being the beneficiary of parents who did everything to give me a full ride for undergraduate and graduate education, um, I was curious if you talked to any parents about this issue of institutional prestige mm -hmm. and whether or not it's worth it. Mm -hmm. And being the mother of a 21-year-old and a 17-year-old who will not attend those kinds of institutions, uh, how you come to peace with the fact that where you go is not who you'll be. Right. But having the generation above you who paid for everything mm -hmm. and made the sacrifices to pay for everything, not them not understanding why financially it's a different world now and that the prestige doesn't really matter. Yeah. Well, I, so I think that the prestige um, and uh, like it factors in, in in a very particular way, given our historical moment, um, because there because there's so much uncertainty and also so much inequality. The idea that there's that if your kid attends a prestigious school, it's going to give them a shot at making this very big leap to the top um, is really important in the focus on the on the prestige of the school. It, like the, the bigger the, the, the social leap, the more parents need to, or, or feel that they need to focus on the prestige. Um, and, uh, and so I, that one of the things that I think is really different from, um, from earlier generations is, and, and actually even regions of the country is that, that, uh, that, that public schools oftentimes have also very high prestige. I mean, I'm also a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. I mean, uh, you know, and there are very few uh, California families who'd be like, Berkeley, not good enough, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so the, that's, uh, you know, so, so there is also a kind of like, an, there is a funny East Coast, West Coast or mid West Coast, Midwest division around, around these issues. But of course you're completely right. Where you're, where you go is not who you are, and I think for for many families, it would uh, be a smart idea to really think very broadly about what kinds of institutions can serve young people well. So I'm gonna come back here and then come back over here. 
Hi. Um, so thank you so much for giving this talk. I've been following your work pretty closely since I saw your op-ed in the New York Times last thank week. Thank um, So I have a two-part question. Um, so my first question is, in your recent article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, you talked about how the FAFSA had certain normative understandings of um, how like, white middle-class families would allocate their income. Mm -hmm. um, the FAFSA privileges um, those kinds of families. Yes. So for me, um, coming from a like non-white middle-class family, I thought that beautifully articulated my experiences with the FAFSA, where my parents' income was allocated um, very differently from what the FAFSA was assuming. So I thought that the FAFSA um, disenfranchised me. Yes. So in your research, I want to know what kind of like racial breakdown um, the 150 people that you surveyed were, um, and if they had different reactions to the FAFSA yes. um, in that regard. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, um, I want to know more about your experiences working with the community organizer and helping with the research. So like, what kind of things do you think that community organizer um, really brought to the surface? 10% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of the families in the book were African-American, 22% Asian, Latino, and the rest white, right? It was roughly demographically representative. Thank you. you. You read the methodological appendix, so good on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you for your question. I think I think that that's uh, I, I think that it's really important to think about how the system that we have privileges white middle class families of a very particular sort, and that sort is the nuclear family that is actually entirely independent of aid. Um, uh, of getting any aid from other families or friends or giving any aid to other families or, or friends. And, and that, that family is actually a, a, a really totally outdated vision, even for the people that it is supposed to be designed for. So, so, so I, I completely can see, and, and I hope that I, I represent in the book, how those, uh, how that kind of, um, how that kind of, uh, Privilege is reproduced through the through the student finance complex, but it doesn't even work for the people that it's mostly supposed to work for. So, the, so really, the only people who can operate in that very, very, very tightly defined nuclear family um, around which we define student aid are quite wealthy, um, generally white uh, people. I mean, uh, either upper middle class or, or upper class. Those are the people who are most likely to um, marry and remain in a first marriage, to be totally, to support only um, the children in their household. And, and that, those responsibilities are the only ones that are fully recognized on the FAFSA form. Everything else is a departure. So, so yeah, I think that one of the things that I think is interesting about making sure that the people I, that I was speaking to are not only those white families is that that uh, that uh, people who are c clearly um, designed out of the system are usually much more critical of it and 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 as a researcher also very helpful in pointing out just how punishing that system can be so I think that that it's I mean you know for many reasons it's very important but including my analysis it's important to, to have to have people who are outside of uh, outside of that tight normative um, structure um, the community organize I mean community organizers are amazing <laughs> yeah there you go. Um, and, uh, and, and so, I mean, it just so happened. Like I, 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 I found, um, a student who was a, a graduate of Wharton and a community organizer. I mean, how many of those exist? Just say like if you combine Barack Obama and Donald Trump in some weird way, like that would be who they were. Yeah. Yeah. I found that guy. <laughs> so, so he knew, he knew tons about, uh, about finance and also tons about how to get people to, uh, to open, to, to open up. Um, and, and that, that, that was that was really magic. I, I can't reproduce it or else I wouldn't have had to hire him. <laughs> so we're going to do a speed round. Uh, so I'm take the last three questions. So here, Professor Klinkner, and then you right there. So if we can... 
do that order and then have you respond to all okay, three. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So my, my question is, let's say I have an or- overarching question, which is, could you have written this book, say, 10 years ago? Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, it seems to me, and you, you kind of explore this in your op-ed and in the introduction to your book, that students are being more open when they get to college about their family financial situation. And it seems like that's a generational, even a kind of minor generational shift than what was happening, let's say, mm-hmm. in, the tw- in, a, in the 2000s, mm-hmm. right? And so my question is, do you, and I know you didn't, let's say, study this specifically, but do you anecdotally see that happening? And are students becoming more open about that once they get to college? And if so, why? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Let's take Philip. Uh, just very briefly. So who benefits from this? I mean, these systems don't create themselves. What, who are the, the people in the interest that, that benefit from this and, and want to keep it going and expand it even? Good Clearly, question. he's a political scientist. <laughs> um, last but not least. Um, my question is just, uh, you know, do you have a sense of whether university administrators really consider this a crisis that they have to do something about by maybe cutting costs? I don't know. You know, like when the iPhone gets to a price that nobody wants to buy it anymore, they start making a cheaper one. And so I'm not saying we should have a cheaper form of education for, you know, a second class education system, but there might be some other option of, you know, the way other organizations in this country would just have to cut costs to make it more affordable. Okay. So. If you were writing the book 10 years ago, yeah. it would be different in terms of student openness. Second, who benefits? Yeah. Third, why don't university administrators give a shit? That's <laughs> not what I heard you say. Yeah. Right. Okay. So so I, I think one of the things that I think is really interesting is that there are uh, 10 that well, – so first of all, I started the research for this book in 2012. So I was kind of writing it almost 10 years ago. But um, one of the big changes, I think, has been that there has been so much student activism and activism around the issue of student debt that has, that has started to kind of shift the way – that it's viewed. So, uh, so before, um, I, I mean, I would even, I would even say it was before Occupy Wall Street, um, being in debt was clearly shameful and, uh, and, and people carry that very closely. I mean, mo- many people, most people, um, I think that that part of what the activism around student debt that came out of Occupy Wall Street did, um, was to start to erode that that shame. Um, and, and I think that that's really, really good. Now, I think that now that there's like a, there, there, there remains a tension about this. It isn't that every student, um, wants to talk about how much debt they have. And certainly for their parents, I don't think that that has shifted as much. Um, but I, but, and this gets to that right to the future idea that I, that I put forward in the, in the final chapter. I think that, that, uh, that younger people who are involved in, uh, movements around student debt and actually also around climate change, um, link those issues and really see that there has to be a break. Um, some kind of significant rupture in the way that we talk about issues like student debt and climate change that will allow us to move forward. So we cannot continue the same way of relating to them. So in that way, I think that the, that I hope um, Indebted really plugs into that sense of change that's being moved forward by, uh, by activists. Um, who, who benefits? benefits? Um, you know, like weirdly, I don't, I don't think really anyone benefits big time from this. I mean, so for the first thing is that the that the federal government is the major lender in the United States. So it is, and and they're not exactly they're not like benefiting big time from it. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that I mean that's the the interest rate is too high. Um, there, you know. Uh, that so so for the normal operation of that this stuff there there aren't a lot of people who are benefiting. I'll tell you who does benefit though is the loan servicers um, whose malfeasance is kind of off the charts in a way. I, I mean I, I I honestly don't quite know how they're getting away with it. And um, there are of course organizations that are working against it, like the um, like teachers unions who are suing uh, the the department of uh, no not they're suing the 
the the loan servicers and maybe maybe also the Department of Education, yep. feeling like maybe you know the facts of this better. But the um, but uh, they're they're suing because they can't get the public loan this public service loan forgiveness that they are due. Um, so loan servicers are certainly making out like crazy. Um, and uh, and 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 well, it's, so the so the banks got mostly got out of the business yeah. in 2010, and it wasn't because they were uh, you know they they were they were um, sort of altruistically giving up a lot of a, a lot of. Uh, their their profits. Um, it, it was a, a combination of like a strand of activism within the government that always wanted those loans, and then also after two thousand and eight, really not wanting to be in the business of yet another consumer loan um, deal. So it's it's not it's not exactly it isn't exactly banks. We have to look for the beneficiaries in different in different places. Um, banks are trying to start to get back into it, though, and I think that we need to be concerned uh, about that um, in these income share agreements. I don't know if you've heard about these, but it's a different way of uh, making a loan without calling it a loan and so therefore not having it regulated as a loan. Um, and so so that that's something that that is uh, that, that is coming coming back. So that so the banks do want in. So we should be guarding so we should be guarding against that. The um, uh, and the last one is university how do we control the yeah. cost and why don't university administrators give a shit? Um, a lot of university administrators do care, um, but there, but, but there isn't enough, uh, there, there certainly is not enough, um, movement. I mean, so one, one issue, which I think is really interesting that I, that I talked to a university president, um, about, um, which is that the, like when, when state legislatures cut budgets, they effectively force the the universities to raise tuitions, and so actually the cost of tuition becomes a uh, a kind of uh, you know a kind of bludgeon against universities. So there's a there's a politics around uh, around the concern about increased education that is not necessarily beneficial either to the universities or the students. Um, you know, public universities uh, don't generally, I mean, the, the administrators of public universities don't generally want those public universities to be so expensive. Um, on the private end, it's a much more complicated scenario. And like at NYU, they are chipping away at this, um, but they are still, um, you know, 50% more expensive than the average private four-year university. So, you know, still, okay, still can not Can I push cheap. you in those? Yeah. I know we're a little over time. Yeah, are, can I connect the last two questions? Because yeah, you could argue university administrators are part of the stakeholders that benefit, Yeah. right, mm -hmm. in terms of the skyrocketing salaries of university administrators over faculty, right? They have a self-interest in actually keeping, at least at private schools, and keeping the system as it is. That that's yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. And that's kind of what I that's what I mean by having to look for. Or at least for they don't want to act. Yeah. To change it. They having to look for the beneficiaries in places where we don't normally look. I think that that's really important. And and so I really I really take your point. And I and and I and I hope that we you know collectively can start doing that more. Um. Any final comments, last words before we thank you? Well, I would just say thank you to everyone who came and to you, Dorian, and, and to Jonathan and Politics and Prose. It's great to be here. Thanks to Caitlin Zaloom. Buy the book, get it signed.